Hey folks, hey. welcome back to The Synthesis. I'm Finally. Alexander Wynn. Sorry, that was real loud. Yes, it was. I'm Alexander Wynn, and this very loud person is... His wife, Lacey Hannon. Yes. Who is going to throw a book at him today. <laughs> Absolutely. We are so glad to be back. Uh, we had some technical difficulties last week, and before that was the holiday. And we're just so happy to be back with all of our beloved fans and, and Jay Briggs. Super, super de duper sorry yeah. that it's been so long. Seriously. You guys, thank you for your patience. Yep. We appreciate you. Felt like I needed to put that out there. Yep. Um, so we are picking up where we left off. We are doing our read through of The Martian by Andy Weir. We are currently doing chapters 11, 12, and 13. And uh, yeah picking back up um we are in th within the story we are on soul 97 and souls are martian days so uh, probably about mm -hmm. uh, 102 days something like that into the adventure uh mark watney has been getting the pathfinder up and running in the hopes of using it to contact earth and he doesn't know it but the people back on earth have picked up on what he's doing and they're working on it too and so far, we've had them switching back and forth between chapters. Yeah. And chapter, is elev chapter 11 is the first time that we have Mark's point of view and the Earthling's point of view. Yeah. It's, it's In intercut the same chapter, for yeah. the first time. And that is not the only format change that we're going to have this episode. Things yeah. are shaken up. He does um, a lot of fun stuff, this weird, yeah. this weird guy. <laughs> He's a very weird guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we start out chapter 11 and we are back on Earth and we're huddled up with the uh, NASA and JPL folks trying to get Pathfinder to connect, uh, or trying to connect to Pathfinder on Mars. And uh, we just have to start out with, with Tim being a jackass. Because Tim is like one of my favorites. <laughs> right? Yes. Because he, like him expressing like, okay, this is this is about we're gonna talk about time lag here, and he goes through all of it, and then the response is, hey, Venkat is, he, he's yeah. got like a degree in physics, man, he knows how to do this, and Tim's response is, you can never tell with managers, and I'm just like sitting here going, this is a good indication that in real life people get promoted past their abilities yep. all the time and their subordinates have to deal with bullshit yep. a lot. It's, <laughs> it's also, I thought, a great way of conveying exposition because that's the kind of thing that you can't actually count on the audience to necessarily know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And so you need somebody to say it and it's always tricky, you know, if, any, if anybody out there is a screenwriter or a, or a novel writer, you know, conveying that kind of information without it being clunky is always hard. And you know, you watch TV, you watch movies, there are plenty of times where people do exposition really badly. And I really like this sort of elegant solution which is you have a douchebag conveyance. <laughs> like he's, he's not even he's a douchebag, though. He's, he's kind of a douchebag. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, he's that snipes. that isn't a perfect example of it, but he's kind of a jackass. I mean, he's a jackass, but that's different from there. There are degrees. There are yes. degrees here. But I just I love that. Like, if you need to tack, if you need to risk talking down to the audience, the way you do it is you just lean into it and you just talk down to people. <laughs> you just have a character and, who's and willing to talk down yeah. to people. And yeah, I I feel like. This is a good, honest snipe. And I yeah. just appreciated that a lot. I also appreciate that Venkat is not a manager who was promoted past his ability. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. obviously, he's highly capable. As, as we have touched mm -hmm. on multiple times, this book is very much competence porn. This is all about the experts doing expert things. And um, I guess Tim just doesn't believe that. He, he, he still needs to be convinced. Yes. <laughs> um, so we hang out with them for a little bit, and then, like Lacey said, we jump back to Mark Watney on Mars pretty quickly. Yes. And this was one of those moments, there are a few moments in this book that the, the relief is just palpable. Oh. It's so, he wakes up and Pathfinder is pointed at Earth. And as he says, Pathfinder has no way of knowing where Earth is. So the only way that it could pick Earth's location out in the sky is if it had connected to earth and he's got a line back to earth and just the way it's described and you know i'm doing Lacey's reading the physical book i'm doing the audiobook narrated by will narrated by will wheaton and just the delivery and everything is so 
like I jumped into chapter 11. I had not been reading through to here. I just started chapter 11 and I was already just like, oh, so palpable. I, I loved that he cried. Yeah. The, I mean, and it makes, it obviously makes total sense, but like the crying and then the immediate, like, I would like to delete things that I've written. Yeah. Um, How do I go through and delete my history? Yeah. With, but is writing that he's crying, it means that he's not embarrassed about the crying. Yeah. And I feel like he's a man secure in his, in his emotional masculinity. And I mm -hmm. love it. And to me, that is, that is Andy Weir taking time to write the future he wants to see. And I say, all creators out there, take note because that's yes. what we should be doing. Yes. And but anyway, I just I love that, you know, it's, it's just such a human thing. He's got this big emotional thing, and then he's also got logic going. Ooh, I wrote a couple of things that I thought nobody would read until I died. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it was it was nice. Yeah. Um, and then at that at that point, we cut back to Earth again, and we're you know we're jumping back and forth pretty quick, and we are in a press conference. And uh, so one of the things that I thought was interesting is there's a fairly lengthy section here in the press conference where, again, it's an, a very elegant way of doing exposition because one of the experts is just being interviewed. What does this mean? What are we going to be able to do? How is this going to change things? You know, this whole story for 10 chapters has been about someone alone. And then we also had these characters over here who are trying to get to the guy who is alone. And so we are totally changing the rules of this engagement. Like this is a totally different kind of story now. It's not somebody who's alone. It's somebody who can talk to Earth. And so we just sort of step through that in the right. press conference. What is this going to mean for the story going forward just to sort of set the tone? See, yeah. now I didn't write anything about this because I jumped straight back to the Tim part. I mean, I read this part. Yes. Don't get, don't get me wrong, but uh, Tim. Tim is my... Oh Can yeah, I no. I've, I've got a note here. The very next line on my notes is waiting for the pan waiting for the panorama. Tim is a douche, and that's fun. Is so you got to You got to find a better word <laughs> because to me, it's him being a smartass. Yeah, I like him, and I want to keep him for this reason alone. It's dry, <laughs> and I love good dry humor. Yeah. But you know, uh, I think it, he's talking to Venkat, and Venkat comes up and says, you know. Anything, Tim? Because they're waiting to get a response. And Tim says, totally. But we're staring at this black screen because it's way more interesting than pictures from Mars. And I feel like if you're an NCIS fan, that's where he would get swatted in the back of the head. Or if your grandpa does that, um, this yeah. is where this is where Tim would get swatted. <laughs> and um, anyway, I just I enjoyed that. Yeah. 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 Um, so one of the things that, you know, we've talked over and over throughout The Martian about things that are sort of fun challenges, mm -hmm. things that are, oh, that's a, that's a fun kind of world to play in a little bit. How do you make water? How do you grow food? You know, these sorts of things. And for me, communicating through the camera falls into that category. Like you've got a camera, it can rotate 360 degrees. They can obviously see you. So one way of communication is taken care of, but how do you get a message back? The camera turns, that's all. Go. And it's fun to watch him sort of walk through. Well, I could put little letters around, but then that would be a lot of letters. So, you know, and sort of playing with all these different uh, ways of doing it before he set finally settles on the one that he does. I personally, right before that, like, you know, he's he asks them a question about, like, can they... Are you reading are me? Are you reading me, yeah. you know? And they can point at yes or no. Yeah. And he's very excited about the yes, because this is the most exciting yes since prom night. <laughs> and yeah. I about lost my mind when I read that, first of all. So funny. Second of all, I was like, yes, get some Mark, you nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And there's like a part of me that's like, yes. Yes. I want the nerds to get this it. This guy is a charming nerd. This yes, guy's, This exactly. guy's making it work. And then, of course, I want to know, did you get some on prom night? Uh, I did not, actually. Ne neither yeah. did I. I mean, yeah. I was I was pretty devout at the time, guys. Yeah. So that wasn't going to happen. To be fair, I didn't actually go to prom with my girlfriend. I went to prom with a friend of mine who had no date, and I was like, "Well, that cannot stand." So so you so I went with my friend, and we had that's a good very time sweet. Yeah. So it wasn't really on it. It wasn't something that I was hoping for on prom night. Um, but yeah, I just I just 
I like it when the when the nerds get theirs. Yeah. Not <laughs> theirs as it's not theirs to whatever. I just I want all nerds to have a little some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Very so big of you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, you know, so what Mark does, he's got this camera that can rotate yeah, on its stand. Yeah, explain this because I don't know what this table is. Okay, so the, you know, the initial thought, obviously, he's got a, he's got a camera that can rotate, so the first thing he does is he sets up yes and no. That's cool, but that doesn't really allow communication. No. That just allows you to respond to questions. So he's got to have some way for them to convey complex information. So his first thought is, I could put letters all the way around, but... You know, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet, and then you're also probably going to need 10 numbers, uh, 0 through 9. And then you might need a question mark. Like, there's kind of a lot of stuff that you would need. And at a certain point, you would have so many things around the circle that each one has such a narrow degree of arc that you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. Is that camera pointed at the M or the N? You know, so he's, he's going, how can I get this in a way that has fewer options? basically, around the circle. And what he settles on is ASCII. Now, ASCII is a way uh, for computers to store text, basically. So, you know, computers work on ones and zeros, and so what they have is a system where uh, hexadecimals, so I'm, I'm suddenly sort of backtracking through all the weird math nerd stuff that I'm going to have to give to describe this. All right, so a base 16 number system. <laughs> <laughs> so hexadecimals are a way of storing 16 digits at a time. So, you know, normally we use 10 digits in numbers, so mm -hmm. we go 0 through 9. This is hexadecimals use 0 through 9 and then a b c d e f. Okay. And so with pairs of these characters, you can store other information. So hex colors is a way of doing colors if you do web design, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But what he's using it for is an alphabet table. Right. So each letter of the alphabet has a different hex code. So for example, A might be 00, zero and then B is 01, and then C is 02. So he's essentially cutting down the symbols he has by like 10. Uh, well, no, because an ASCII table doesn't just include letters, it also includes numbers, it also includes symbols, like he probably has emojis as an option that they could send him that is all laid out in this ASCII table, depending on what kind of ASCII, like depending on how it's formatted. But the idea is that he can now have every letter of the alphabet, all the numbers, punctuation marks, whatever he needs that they can send him, all he has to do is go through and he'll see the camera turns like A6, 8, 4, 0, 2. And so these pairs, he can then take, compare to the table, and he can see, oh, 0, 2 is the letter C. And then Right, eight, but that's four, what I'm saying is so instead of through, having, yeah. you, you have 16 symbols instead of exactly. your normal, yes. Yeah, 16 so symbols right. plus, a, right. plus, that's a, all that plus a question card. Yeah. Okay. So he will mm. scratch them into the sand as he mm -hmm. is watching the camera turn around, and then he can take this undecipherable gibberish and go compare it to the ASCII table and turn it into letters and a message. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get it. It's just yeah. real boring. So I'm glad that they didn't go into it too much. Cause See, I thought it was awesome and fascinating. I was cool. I was actually way more interested in can like in how the Pathfinder yeah. was going to how they were going to actually communicate back and forth. Yeah. Well, I liked the okay, the Pathfinder can talk to Earth and the Sojourner, but the Sojourner isn't working, so how do we do right. this? And then getting the rover to have to work with the hab. Yeah. Instead, and I just I found like I found that all a lot more interesting than the ASCII table. Yeah, and I wanted to move on. Which I did. I did notice uh, w another thing that we've mentioned before. I really like the fact that you know Mark is clearly a genius in sort of the MacGyver sense. Mm -hmm. But I really like the fact that he's not always the one with every solution. And in this particular case, it was actually Johansson that had the ASCII table. Johansson is the, the computer specialist. She's the, the software nerd on the team. And so she was the one who had this vital tool. He didn't know it. 
He just well, knew that she Well, he didn't know it, but he, he came up with the solution. Yeah, he had the then, idea, yes. but she was the one with the information that allowed him to do it. And I just, I appreciate that even though the, the crew of Ares 3 aren't here, that they're still contributing, you know? He's right. still, you still get the sense that it wasn't sort of a one-man mission to Mars. There were a whole bunch of really competent people here, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now he just has their stuff, but it still helps. Yes. Uh, I have to say, so going back to Earth. Yep. Y'all, Jack annoys the shit out of me. He's the one who comes in and starts talking to Venkat, and Venkat's like, dude, like, I don't care about all of these extra things. Be and I'm just sitting here going, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be concise. Get to the point, And yeah. then get out, yeah. man. There are, uh, nobody cares about this extra stuff. We're trying to get Mark home. And we don't have to, you know, you can't act like you're in an emergency for the next however many years he's going to be there. But get to the point. We yeah. are actually on a mission right now. Yeah. So I, I love Tim and I hate Jack. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah. and his, But his idea is brilliant, which is the software patch that will allow them yeah. to communicate over. I mean, sure. Over. You can be brilliant and still be hated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to be tiptoeing around Lacey a little bit tonight. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to tiptoe around me. Just yeah. don't be like Jack. Be concise. Get to the point. You say that like it's something I'm good I'm, at. He's uh. terrible at it, you guys. <laughs> this is probably why I can't handle it in anybody else. I like I. He's maxed out with me. Yeah, I just I've learned to have all sorts of patience with his talking, and then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Everybody okay. else, I'm like, okay, no, 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 you got it. The end. Move along. The end. See, the way you feel about me is the way I feel about Jay Grape. Hey. <laughs> um. You're ridiculous. Okay, so the other person I love is Annie. Is Annie? Is Annie? Because they're because they're gonna meet in, in the, the middle. middle. They're gonna meet in the middle. One of the greatest lines in this book. She's talking about how some people are crawling up her ass and some, some people, people are, are reaching down, down her, her throat, throat. <laughs> and they're gonna meet in the middle, Venkat, and that's fantastic. I just I love her so much. Yes. The profanity, the power, the she's just she's my kind of gal. We're we're gonna get to the movie after we finished our read through, and so I've been trying to keep the movie references down. But that being said, Kristen Wiig was the absolute perfect casting. Which is funny because I don't remember it. Really? I don't remember her. Um, I probably will once I start watching it. Mm -hmm. This is this is an ongoing thing, though, you guys. Like this is not putting anybody down. I do not remember books and movies after I've seen them. I just they kind of disappear because I'm I I I think I read too fast. Yeah. Or something. I don't know. But I just don't. I don't retain it. It's not because <laughs> anybody's performance sucks or anything like that. Kristen yep. Wiig is great. Yep. Okay. I, I, I have noticed. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is true for me in all science things. I don't retain a lot of it. Like, I'll learn what it is, and then I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And then I just don't mm -hmm. keep it yeah. in my brain. You, you sort of verify but don't store it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. L and LCD stands for liquid. Mm -hmm. And I will absolutely retain that for the rest of my life. That is <laughs> because he ruined a laptop. Because outside. he yes, yep. and his zero out of ten consumer review had I was cackling. Yeah. I just I appreciated that. Yes, I I really appreciated. The, there's a line that was one of those things. You know, there's there's a special category of knowledge which is the stuff that you sort of knew but didn't properly appreciate. You mm -hmm. hadn't actually stopped to think about it, even though it was already in there. I really love that point that they make where they're discussing whether or not to tell the rest of the Hermes crew about whether Mark is alive. And the point that gets made is, you know, nobody's focusing on it, but they're actually in more danger than he is right now. You know, he's stranded on Mars, but at least he's on a planet. They're in space, and that's scary. And that's the argument that is made for not telling them yet. And that's an interesting argument. I don't like, know that I buy it, though, because he's in a hab that could somehow get destroyed or like he's doing everything on his own he can't last forever whereas these people are in in yeah he's he's definitely in more long-term danger in terms of like will this hab survive until Ares 4 gets here and that sort of stuff but in terms of the day-to-day -day, deep almost, space is is he's almost harder died 
more times than any of them have. Yeah, I just like <laughs> emotionally, I get where the, the argument yeah. is, part of the argument is, hey, this will put them in danger because their emotional state will get in the way of their work mm. and that is dangerous, right? And I get that. But simultaneously, like, you don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't buy it. And I yeah. and I, I I guess I kind of I get the I get that the argument is there. I just yeah. don't I just don't buy yeah. it. I that being said, uh, I think another person who doesn't buy that is Mark Watney. And I love how much he won't shut up about absolving his team. Yeah. It's like Aww. a really it's it's one of those things that sort of the writer didn't need to do. Say it once it's not the crew's fault. You've, est you've established that. You can move on. But this is important. Yeah. This is important to Mark that, no, seriously, it's not their fault. And really driving that point home is, is great. And it takes us into Chapter 12. Well, are we, are, we are not done we are not with done Chapter, chapter 11, 11. because of course we're not done with Chapter because 11. Why don't you take us through the rest of Chapter 11? It's, it's just this portion where he has, like, he, he does this long message right that mm -hmm. he's sending back and i'm not gonna be able to find it but it, he's already been told to watch his language <laughs> because the world is reading what he's writing and at the end the warning has been made and how does he end this message look a pair of boobs yep. and then he does what he does uh open parentheses period capital y, y period close parentheses and i'm just boobs. like boobs Oh, you're such a high schooler. But that's funny. <laughs> that's come so on. funny. That come is, on. That's like. And the, like, the what are they going to do? He's on Mars. Like, yeah. you're going to come fire me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you're going to leave me here? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's just, again, Andy Weir is so good at at bringing this character to life and keeping the humor alive for the sake of the audience. He could have taken this to a, such a dark place and reasonably. But he chose not and, to, and, like, and it's more fun. Not just reasonably, but that's sort of like the the right way to do it. Like yes. when you've got a guy stranded on Mars, the the way you do that right is to you raise the stakes, you make it dramatic, you make it scary, and he went completely the other way, and it works. Mm -hmm. It does, totally does. I it's it's not following in falling into the stereotype, and yeah. I think that's part of why this is such a standout yeah. story. All right, now we can so, go on to Chapter 12. He's absolving his crewmates, which takes us into Chapter 12. Uh, chapter 12, again, shakes up the formula of this book, which is a lot of fun because all of a sudden it's a flashback. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, a, it's not Mark Watney giving a dialogue. It's actually sort of a fictional third-person narrative featuring Mark Watney. Uh, we flash back to the Ares 3 mission. And the whole team is there on the ground. And we finally get to meet the Ares crew. And this is something that I had kind of forgotten because I, you know, I've seen the movie. I've read the books before. It, I, it wasn't really in the forefront of my mind that we hadn't actually met them yet. Yeah, I had the exact same thing. Them. I was like, why are we doing this? Because in my head, I do have most of the crew members in my head at, yeah. as stand-ins for these, for these characters that we've written, like, that we've heard about. Yeah. yeah. And so I... I guess yeah. I got really bored in this chapter <laughs> because I was like, I already know all of this. Yeah. So I don't have very, m I have a couple of them. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was cool to go back to sort of plan A, you know, to see how was this mission supposed to go. And they're mm -hmm. collecting rock samples and they're, you know, doing all this stuff. It was great to see their banter. Some of the, some of the lines that get tossed back and forth between different characters uh, are great. And again, are perfectly captured in the film. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's cool to see how this went down. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, The Synthesis is a show where we talk about scientific accuracy, and so it is necessary to bring it back around to chapter one and talk about how this storm is impossible. Yes. This is the one thing in this story which is very grounded in real science. This is one thing that Andy Weir gave himself permission to just make it wrong, just go with it. Uh, Mars's atmosphere is, uh, about half of a percent as thick as Earth's atmosphere, you could get hurricane speed winds and you would not be able to feel it through your spacesuit. Like it, w it might kick up some dust. There's no air on Mars. And so the, like 
the kind of wind that they are experiencing is the kind of wind that would you would need to set off a nuclear bomb to get that kind of wind. Um, it's not realistic. That being said, it is dramatic, and I thought this chapter did a really good job yes. of portraying a crisis. Mm -hmm. This is a scary situation, and it's a bunch of people who are very professional and very well trained and very good at not freaking out. Yes. This is scary. And that really comes across. Nobody loses their cool. Nobody freaks out the way you would in, you know, some zombie movie. But you can tell the way people are handling things, the way they're moving quickly. And it's, this is high drama. Yes. Yeah. I will say that once Mark Watney is out of the picture and we're just following the rest of the crew, I actually super struggle with Commander Lewis. Really? And I'd, I'll be interested well, yeah. to hear your take on it. Yeah. But she took so much time looking for Mark mm -hmm. that she put everybody else's li lives in danger. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that because her job is to get as many people off that planet as possible. And I, I recognize that when you become a family, you don't want to leave anybody behind. Mm -hmm. But with the information she had mm -hmm. and... And you know that the rest of your team is going to have a hard time following your orders to leave you behind. Mm -hmm. You are putting them all at risk of dying there because they don't want to follow the commands because you are taking too long. Yeah. And they keep telling her, like, you have to come back. The, you know, the, it's going to fall over. What is it called? The Mav. The Mav is going to... It's going to tip, tip over, and so then the they're all screwed. The idea is the Mav, you can picture it like a building or a tower, and the wind is pushing it so that it's starting to tilt, and they've calculated that if it goes past a 12% tilt, that's the tipping point where it'll just fall over, and now they're all stranded on Mars. Mm -hmm. So the risk is we have to get it before it starts tilting past 12%. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. And in fact, it actually goes past 12%. And they have to use the thrusters to push it back upright. Right. And and, yeah. s and so to me, I, th I feel like part of the commander's job is to do a risk assessment. And mm -hmm. so it was her job to not let the temptation of not following her orders happen at all. Yeah. And I know that means she spends less time looking for Mark. And that's awful. But what would have been more awful is what would have happened if that m if the map had fallen over. Yeah. And so I really, really struggled with her decision. You know, I I thought that that was human. Like I thought that it, I thought that it was believable because you know he he gets knocked away. She doesn't know if he's dead. Like there's a re a bio monitor reading that reads zero, but you know there could still you could still resuscitate him like there's still hope and she's you know her you said her job was to get as many people off of that planet as she could really her job was to get everyone off that planet I, and so I hear that. there's a point at which you triage but i thought that it was believable and i do think True. she waited too long like if i was her boss when she got back to earth i would have been like you that was not what you were supposed to do but i thought it was very believable as a as a commander not wanting to leave someone behind. Well, and I get that. I think yeah. it, I think it was very human, yeah. but I think that the that the risk assessment of he he could be resuscitated versus how many people are going to die just by the yeah. mav falling over. Yeah. To me there is a a balance there she that did, she did the math wrong. Yes. Yeah. And I I just I super struggled with it, especially because the team is struggling with it yeah. and w you know the yeah there's, the a, there's a little bit of infighting between yeah. a couple of people on how we should handle this situation and should we even follow her order and exactly yeah. and so um anyway i i get it's and totally it, human, it is worth mentioning that beck is on your side there is somebody on the crew who's like commander you need to get in here uh -huh. <laughs> this is not how you should be handling this situation and so it's like it's not you know, that's that's Commander Lewis's mistake, not Andy Weir's mistake. Yeah, like, exactly. And well, that's and there's a certain amount of, okay, you're you're playing the hero. Mm -hmm. You said leave, she said to leave her behind, except mm -hmm. for nobody wants to lose two people. Right. Because then somebody else is having to pull the trigger on that decision. Yeah. And it's your job as commander to be making the decisions that keep yeah. as many people alive as possible. So you're you're kind of passing off this responsibility that I, I struggled with it, again, 
good writing, yeah. human choice, but I personally struggled with. I will say there's a great moment that, you know, it's one of those things that like, if it hadn't been there, it would have been fine, but the fact that it is there is so great, which is that Mark Watney, who has not yet been stranded on Mars and has not yet had to learn how to make water and grow f crops and all this kind of stuff, even during the storm, he's suggesting solutions. He's coming up with, he's like, well, we could, we could use the, the cables to pull the MAV back up right. We could, we could brace the MAV against, MAV against the wind. We could, he's coming up with all this stuff and his teammates like, okay, man, like, you know, whatever. And they kind of move on. But it's this little bit of sort of retro foreshadowing yeah. the character that we know. Well, and it also shows how he r responds to stress. Yeah, his, exactly. His this reaction is, is not emotional. It's very logical. Yeah. And it's problem solving yeah. as a as a yeah. And some and I've and I've watched that happen. I've done it before. I've seen other people do that. So mm -hmm. again, it's uh, you know, uh, Andy yeah. Weir is just I guess one of my favorite writers, and I think I didn't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Um, there is you know we've talked a couple of times uh, on the synthesis so far about sort of the alternate universes of The Martian, different ways that this could have gone. Uh -huh. And one of those alternate universes that is very interesting, I'm sure there's like some fan fiction out there that somebody's tackled this premise, is what would have happened if Mark Watney and Commander Lewis were stranded on Mars? Oh, The MAV takes off. They follow her orders. The MAV takes off. She goes back to the HAB. Mark wakes up. I'd like walks to see into the map. Okay, see, I'm not particularly into, into fan fiction. Yeah, yeah, I'm not particularly into fan fiction, but I would almost be interested in seeing someone do that because, yeah. you know, n the potatoes aren't going to last as long. Exactly. But things might go smoother, you know, just like what works yeah, and having, what doesn't. Having two hands on some of these problems might really help, having somebody to bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, yeah, the food won't last as long. Uh, you, know, some, you know, when the airlock blew up, one of them probably would have died. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, although I guess we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, yeah, don't don't so spoil. Sorry. God. I mean, it'll be this episode. Let's but, you know. Okay, uh, hold on. First of all, I want to say that I'm really into Iman Economist because we are the same person. <laughs> well, I mean, we're on the <laughs> same page. First of all, the not remembering the books and movies and whatever. Yeah. Like, thank you. Yes. And also, you know, just I, it does. I think that I think. You make a great point about how it seems like he almost wants to be there more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is like, "Oh crap, we're gonna die," and he's like, "Let's stay. Let's yeah, let's we can like make this yeah, work. It's okay." Exactly. So I thought yeah. that is a, that's a really good point. Yeah, I hadn't noticed an that. Excellent observation. Yeah. Um, so Commander Lewis does in fact come back into the Mav. They take off. Mm -hmm. Everybody's real sad, obviously, and then gentle sobbing. Yeah. He does such a good job. Like, these are characters that we don't even <sighs> barely know, but he does such a good job with uh, these little moments that tell you who they are. You know, Johansson, we, I think we've already established that Johansson is hot, that Johansson is, like, way prettier than your average is astronaut. Is Johansson played by Kate Mara? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we've established that she's particularly good looking. She's, she's the only one who's sobbing, but at the same time, like, uh, Beck is clearly a little more practical. He's the one who was saying, Commander, you have to come in. Like, yeah. you know, my friend just died. And, and he's the first one who's willing to say that Mark is dead. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's just these little nuggets that sort of give you a taste of who these different characters mm -hmm. are. Yeah. Um, so we flash forward now back to the present day, and they're finally telling them. We've, oh. It's this great moment where we keep, when are we going to tell them? When are we going to tell them? When are we going to tell them? And then we meet them. We see them. We see how it happened. Now we're going to tell them. It's great timing. Oh, that I left. I left him behind. Yes. Just like, that's when I just broke for Johans or for Lewis, for Lewis because yeah. I was just like, yeah, you worked so hard, put and put everybody else at risk, and. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, your your worst fear wasn't wrong. Exactly, he was alive. He wasn't dead. You left him behind, and, and he just there's she th lets everybody else off, all, everybody else off the hook yeah. too, because she's like, you didn't do it. You were following orders. I left him behind. Yeah, and that is, you know, they they tell writers that you know every character is the star of their own story. And, you know, one of the marks of a good writer is that you can look at secondary characters and be like, oh, this story could have been about you. You know, it's not, it, this, it, this isn't just James Bond where all the uh, other characters in the movie are just sort of cardboard cutouts for him to play against. 
you know, when, when you look at a really good story, every character has their own desires and their own sort of struggles and that sort of thing. And that, to me, really jumped out as Commander Lewis is the star of her own story. There is a Commander Lewis movie happening in the yeah. background of The Martian, and she has a really powerful redemption arc because everybody's celebrating, and then she's over here with her own motivations. And just a, a writer who is capable of setting up a scene like that where everybody's on the same page and then you realize that one of them isn't. They're having their own personalized response instead of the sort of group response. And what's so beautiful about that is is really we are all the stars of our own show. Yeah. Like that's just kind of how we tend to live our lives. Yeah. And that doesn't m mean that we're all egocentric or whatever. That's just it's hard to imagine everybody else's motivations and yeah your reality is different than the person next yeah. to you, their reality. So I, I love that that is built into this story. Yeah. Yep. It's just, it's so great. She's she's responding the way she would. Yep. Um, and that's chapter 12. So uh, you, you you found that boring? I found that incredibly I, dramatic. I, I did to start with purely because, I mean, I think I kind of wasn't having it the night that I read yeah. these um, because I was real bored with part of chapter 13, too. Yeah. Um, that doesn't stay true for very long, but I think it's because it is the part of the movie that I remember is is the beginning, is how it happened that he's there. Yeah. I, uh, as a bit of uh, synthesis backstory, while Lacey was reading chapter 13, I walked in and was like, hey, how are you doing? And she looks up from her book, and she looks at me and goes, I'm reading about fabric. <laughs> and then she just went back to her book, and I was like, I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got all, but he like got a little excited about it, and I was like, because yeah, that fabric stuff is ominous as hell. Okay. So we'll get there. Chapter 13, again, the first note I have is ominous backstory. <laughs> we start with the Hab Campus was produced at no, a facility. No, 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 we blah, don't. Blah, blah. Is, that, yeah. is that the first thing? I think it is. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. It's the I first thing know. I noted. Okay, well, I noted about Mark getting pissy. <laughs> okay. Listen, listen, he's in communication with Earth yep. and. He's thing he's been desperately trying to do for four months. Exactly. And it's just so human to get so annoyed with them so fast. I mean, he, he calls them dipshits, and I cackled. I was out loud just, yeah, cackling. Yeah. Because it is so human to get just to do that 180. Yeah. And I love it. I love that it's not like overly, um, you know, it's, it's not too sentimental. It's yeah. not like, oh. Like, they're annoying me, but, you know, I'm glad that I get to even talk to them. Right. No, no, he's like, you guys are dipshits. Go away. Yes. I am the best botanist <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't need you. Yeah. I don't need you to tell me that I'm doing it right. Yeah, I fucking know. I feel like this is one of those things that, that is very plausible coming from an astronaut. You know, like, not, not everybody could make it through an astronaut program. I feel like astronaut programs, so, like, they, they select for the kind of people who don't want to be micromanaged, who, who are a little bit hot shots or very confident in their own abilities. Yeah. <laughs> and so I like the fact, I, I have a feeling that any astronaut who read this book would have been like, yes, that. They check in to see when you go to the bathroom. Go away. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, exactly. Leave yeah. me alone. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but ominous backstory, setting up something about the have canvas. Weird, yes. like where was it manufactured, and how was it manufactured, and when was it inspected, and Fabric then we just interviews. cut back to Mars, and then we just cut back to Mars, and hey, Mark Watney's doing his thing, and we go around for a little while, and then it cuts back. The Hab Campus was loaded into the rocket, and da 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 da. da. This is like this is where my mother would be like, blah blah blah, <laughs> quote end quote. Yeah. Um, see, and see to me, this uh, this uh, recalls an old Onion video that was released like 10 years ago, which is uh, nation panics as ominous music heard across the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just about weird, creepy music coming from nowhere and everybody freaking out because they feel like something's coming. That's how I feel about this. Like, <laughs> why are you talking about the Hab Canvas? This incredibly important thing that is vital to our hero's survival. Why are you drawing our attention to it repeatedly? 
you keep coming back to it. What is going on? That Onion article is incredibly like, tense. Kind of makes me think of Stranger Than Fiction. Isn't that the one where Will Ferrell is? Yes. Yes. His life starts being narrated. Yeah. By he, Emma it Thompson. Turns out he's a character in a book, and he can <laughs> hear the narrator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so he did uh, so he's growing his crops and there is a particularly funny mention that you will know if you ever saw a trailer for The Martian because it was in like all the trailers which is that when you grow crops in a place technically you have colonized it and so Mark Watney gets to be the guy who colonized Mars yes uh, which is interesting because that's not the definition not that I've ever heard no. like yeah I, I wonder where that comes from where that definition comes from because a colony you know one of the things that we uh w sort of worked through a little bit in Terragenesis is the word colony and colonize because not only does it have a pretty sordid history in terms of the age Rat of colonization very, and very sordid history yeah like what all that meant but also it's a specific legal term you know a colony is a thing that has a specific relationship to the mother country. And you, you know, not everything is a colony. And so that's one of the things we wrestled with in Terragenesis is, you know, the whole point of Terragenesis is declaring independence, at which point you are no longer a colony. But right. even if it's a well, mining it outpost, doesn't it's not it have something to do with like with they're already like being people there oftentimes yeah a colony like is like a it, it's uh, i forget the the technical definition but it's like a, it's a group of people who are away from their mother country who don't have any legal control over their own sort of well-being uh so for example california is not a colony of the united states because california participates in the government of the united states mm -hmm. um but you know there th there's sort of a point by point thing of what is a colony yeah and so i'm surprised that andy weir who i trust like it, presumably he put this in there because he found some definition but i've never seen a definition that has to do with growing crops so yeah well and so like i think i mean i think the scientific community has come up with different words because yeah. because to go out onto other planets does like you said yeah, doesn't necessarily mean that you're coloni colonizing it so I think they've come up with, I think they just use settle there, generally, which yeah, is kind of boring if you ask me. There are a few terms. Um, Bill Nye and the Planetary Society likes to use settle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually not that big a fan of settle because first off, it's boring. Um, to settle literally means like to stop doing stuff. Uh, and it's see, it feels very small just based on the yeah. way that we've kind of used it historically. Yeah, a settlement is like, y you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say a settlement on Mars of one million people. Yeah, a settlement is only like a few dozen people. But, um, and then the other thing for me, and this is sort of a nitpicky point, but I feel like it's, it will be important in the adoption of the term, is it's kind of ambiguous in certain ways. Settlement is the act of doing it, the settlement of Mars, mm -hmm. but then a settlement is also the place. So if you talk about the settlement of Mars, are you talking about the act of colonizing it or are you talking about the colony on Mars? Right. The settlement of Mars. So it's, it, you know, it just sort of, it's kind of hard to use really, which is why in Terragenesis, we ended up reviving a word that is very old and doesn't really get used very much, but I think it's sort of the best word, and I would very much like it if everybody would help spread it, because I would like to make an impact on the zeitgeist, uh, which is hominize, to hominize a place. It is mm -hmm. to bring humans to a place, to make a place suitable for humans. And in addition to just being right, that is a better description of what we are doing in space, wherever we go, we're gonna be bringing people. So what? whatever the legal definition of how that relates back to Earth is, you're bringing people, you're hominizing it. What are the different forms that you use? Um, which is the other thing that I really like about it is it's very parallel to colonize, hominize and colonize. You can have hominists just like colonists. You can have hominy just like a colony. It, it sort of fits the same kind of linguistic niche as colony, mm -hmm. um, but it's a better definition. It's because a better definition. It doesn't have the the baggage. Yeah, it doesn't have the weight of history. You right. know, a lot of people, you know, if you go to a lot of places, but just to pick one, for example, India has a huge problem with the word colony because they were a colony and that's a bad thing. They don't want to yeah. be a colony. And yeah. so when you look at science fiction worlds like The Expanse, if you went to Mars in The Expanse, colony would be a very dirty word because yeah. they had to declare independence from Earth. They are not a colony. 
And so if you talk about colonizing Mars, I have a feeling those Martians would have a strong objection. Yeah. So and and people have often had that objection, you know, for for their various histories of yeah. their their ancestors and whatnot. So even I going think back to the ancient Greek colonies, it's like right. it's sort of never so good to be a colony. Yeah. And to be colonized. So yeah. I think I think that there needs to be a better word. Yeah. I don't know what he'd be the first uh, what, what what's the word? Instead of being the first he colonist. Hom he hominized Mars. No, but Instead the first of, Yeah, hominist. Of Mars? Yeah. Oh, I like that. See, I like that yeah, better. Right? Okay. It just so. it, I you know, the other thing is a lot of people like the word colonize. Like they grew up with this sci fi like we're gonna colonize Mars. I like the word colonize, but it's again, it's got bad history and it's not legally right and yeah. so harmonize done done you know? easy yeah i harmonized mars mm -hmm. sold so spread the word harmonize that's that's one space. that's the one we should be using yeah. let's let's go with that uh, okay next up there's a great little moment that made me laugh even though it's not actually that funny but just like come on man uh, which is he talked about how he established a secondary communication system with nasa of placing rocks on the ground for morse code uh, because using rocks to do dots and dashes is a lot easier than using rocks to actually make like big old English letters. And he says, hopefully it won't come up. <laughs> and I'm just sitting here going, dude, have you been paying attention? It's absolutely going to come up. <laughs> this is, uh, again, for the writers out there, this is something called Chekhov's gun, which is a principle in writing, which is that if you introduce something, you have to pay it off. Mm -hmm. If you introduce a gun in Act 1, the gun has to go off by Act 3. And so when Mark Watney says, hey, I've got this other system for communicating with NASA just in case the Pathfinder breaks, hope I won't have to use it, that is absolutely Chekhov's gun. You're going to have to use it, man. You, you, I, I you, feel like... You jinxed it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I felt like a lot of this chapter, early on at least, is just getting everyone in contact and on the same page. So yeah. it's like Lewis to Watney, Watney to Lewis, NASA acknowledging that it has that it has more time to deal with things than expected because he has crops. Like it's just it gets yeah. a bit boring. But I did find that the that the fabric interludes were bizarrely interesting because the rest of it was boring. <laughs> and I kind of got mad about it cuz the interludes are weird. They're but very specific. They're, they're very specific. I, Do, I have it didn't read questions. as ominous for you. Well, of course, but like, listen, there are just I had some questions by the end of it that I was like, okay, so we're gonna jump a little bit ahead just because it's all about the fabric. Mm -hmm. Why, 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 why would you put it on a plane? specifically just like this and store it just like this and then you're going to take the plane up even higher than you normally would because you want it to have you know the the smoothest flight possible and then you're going to take it through through getting through multiple atmospheres and that's not smooth at all mm -hmm. like it's it's totally i think it's just minimizing risk it's going to have to go through those two atmospheres anyway so let's minimize whatever we can you know Lacey's not having it. I'm not having it. I don't be, This is going to be it. the I synthesis. Don't, don't Lacey's not having it. That's our new tagline. I um, don't buy it. I think that's what it is. <laughs> uh, there was a moment that I really enjoyed, which, uh, or, or rather, I, I would have enjoyed. He didn't go there, but I feel like it was interesting. It would have been interesting if he had, which is, he talks about how he's got potatoes now. He's growing potatoes. He has food that he has grown himself, and not just potatoes for replanting, he actually has now potatoes for eating. And he talks about how am I gonna store them? Because you know I'm not gonna need them for a while and I don't want them to rot. <laughs> and the answer <laughs> is, good. you just throw them outside because Mars is gonna suck all the water out of them instantly and the whole planet is one giant freezer. So you just throw them out the door and that's where he keeps his potatoes, presumably just in like a big pile out by the airlock. Um, so then he's gonna have dried potatoes. So he's gonna have, yeah, it's gonna be dried, but they're gonna be preserved, they're not gonna rot, which is great. Um, but very dusty. <laughs> like we've already established that this is this is a, a world where he has to go out every couple of days and blow dust off of the the solar panels. And you don't want to eat that dust. And you don't want to eat that dust. And so and you're gonna have to wash them. By off. the way, radioactive dust. Um, and so yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised that Andy Weir didn't go into like you're eating. Okay, you've got potatoes, but they're covered in red Martian <laughs> dust. Like, 
he doesn't i don't think he has like a faucet like a kitchen sink yeah, that he can no. like i wish that he had gone into that that's the kind of thing that he does go into a lot in this yeah book, so then you notice that it's missing yeah. some of that detail yeah that makes sense yeah i i just want to say one more it's like listen and just one more thing about that that fabric thing with mm -hmm. the, with the plane and the and the atmospheres and all of this mm -hmm. stuff okay see it, this is why it doesn't make sense to me because it's like it's like you're giving a baby a bath and you're gently sudsing it right just imagine this and then you throw the baby out the window with the bath water like it doesn't make sense why would you treat it like this perfect precious little baby and then just throw it out the damn window because they didn't throw it out the window. That's, was, that's pretty much they, what they did. They did everything they could to protect it, recognizing that they can't do everything. Recognizing that it's going to turn into a teenager someday. That's some weird hat canvas, but okay. I'm just saying, um, like, it's it just it seems bizarre to yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, so, over the course of the episodes that we've been reading The Martian, we've established a number of things that Mark Watney is. Mark Watney is a genius. Mark Watney is very upbeat. Mark Watney is the greatest botanist on Mars. But now, in chapter 13, we have definitively established one thing that Mark Watney is not, and that is the urinating champion of all time. And that made me laugh so hard. I don't no, even I'm not the urinating champion of all time. He's talking about water usage and <laughs> how much water is getting sucked up by the water reclaimer. And he says, no, I'm not the urinating champion of all time. And I got flashed into my head like an Olympic stadium urinating competition and a whole thing sort of flashed through my mind in an instant and it was thoroughly hilarious. I so I and I don't even remember it. Yeah. So I'm I am more taken by his expletives. So Yeah. Cuz again, <laughs> your girl loves expletives. Yeah. Yes, she fucking does. <laughs> um so coming back around to the dust on the potatoes and that kind of little nitty gritty thing. He actually does do one thing which I really appreciated, which is maintenance on the water reclaimer. Turns out that the efficiency has been dropping and he wants to repair it and NASA's like, no, you're gonna kill yourself. And so he does it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> just to I be just, ornery. I think I think what's interesting is in this chapter we get Mark's new perspective on what is life threatening and what is not. Yeah. And that is a fast that's it's fascinating that we're managed to anticipate that psychological change mm -hmm. because yeah, when you are in gotten used to it yeah, yeah if you are going to be in a long-term high-risk situation your idea of what is worth being concerned about is going to change mm -hmm. absolutely and so I, I just I think I might be in love with Andy Weir's brain, <laughs> and so I need to check in with him and see if he'll be my plan B. <laughs> <laughs> just, All right, just folks, well, you heard it here first. <laughs> my wife is leaving me Never. for Andy Weir. No, not, um, not, not really, just, <laughs> just if, if it's if an option. You, in, if, if you have to in the future, <laughs> yeah. Um, so throughout Chapter 13, we've been establishing Hab Canvas, where it was produced, where it was inspected, how uh -huh. it was shipped to Mars, how it was thrown out with a baby and grew up into a teenager. And now, at the end of the chapter, we see why. Okay, but you, s hold on. Okay, go ahead, we can jump no, back. No, do your thing. That was, that was my big sting. Okay, commercial break, we're gonna come back. Now we're gonna do your, your stuff and then we'll, we'll get to the payoff later. So, oh, yeah. okay. I just, uh, it's about the water reclaimer. Okay. It's all of that stuff. Yeah. Because he says that, he talks about why he's being adversarial and that, you know, and what NASA looks for in astronauts, kind of like you said before, mm -hmm. is independence. Yeah. And if he was afraid of touching everything or literally anything, he wouldn't be alive. So I love that he wouldn't go against his orders from Lewis, mm -hmm. but he will absolutely flout the requests of NASA bureaucrats. Yeah. And I just, I want to be like Mark when I grow up and have that sort of confidence. Yeah. To just be like, no, I'm no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait on you. This you're, you're doing it stupid because you don't understand what is life threatening and what is not because you're not here. Yeah. And you know he's the expert. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, not on water reclaimers, obviously, but you know 
the water reclaimer story is another great moment of we're going okay what would go wrong and let's go through the details of yep. it okay we're going to take it and he's going to mark every, every single, single piece, piece and he's doing this he knows it's probably a clog it is mineral water okay that's smart like it's that mm -hmm. is such a normal thing yeah and i i loved going through the detail of that i loved the emotional reaction he has to nasa and mm -hmm. the screw you guys i'm gonna do what i want and i don't know just yeah. um i like that nasa called him a dick <laughs> <Yeah>. that's <laughs> maybe one of my favorite things because probably not all of nasa's messages are being read and yeah. so they can do that <laughs> <laughs> exactly so uh, anyway on to the fabric yes so it's worth revisiting here uh, the hab in the world of the Martian is not the way it's often pictured in a lot of science fiction stories oftentimes habs on Mars are depicted as buildings they're sort of uh, built off of the same model as the International Space Station they've got the white walls and sort of steel beams wrapping around you know often some kind of cylindrical kind of thing with a little hatch doorway sticking out um, and that's not what we have here over and over and over we are reminded that the hab is basically a tent the hab is made of canvas it's something that ripples during the storm it's not a rigid structure thus he is in more danger than the rest of the crew <laughs> um, so the hab is something that can for example deflate and we've been following this hab canvas throughout its life cycle and now mark watney steps into the airlock and pressurizes it and it explodes and the way it is described was so just like breathtaking in sort of the literal sense in just yeah. this like <gasps> kind of like oh my god it just becomes a cannon the whole thing you can just picture the cylinder sticking off of a sort of half dome tent and all of a sudden it just becomes a cannon and the full force of the atmosphere in this building launches the cylinder and he's inside just as it rolls across the landscape finally comes to a to a stop and he's just like are you fucking kidding me yeah. <laughs> like just when everything was starting he was starting to get a handle on it and the whole hab explodes and that's where we end and chapter 13. That's when I was like, oh, remember when I said the fabric was marginally interesting because the rest of the chapter is really effing boring? Well, way to prove me wrong, weir. Ugh, you jerk. Seriously. S so much for being my plan B. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. She's breaking up with me. <laughs> um, I just do 180s left and right. You don't want to be with me. <laughs> uh, so that is it for this episode of The Synthesis. Next week, we're going to be picking up with the next uh, three or four chapters of The Martian and uh, taking it from here, seeing how do you, <laughs> what do you do when your hab blows up on Mars? What do you do when you're Mark and not everybody else? Yeah. Because yeah. those are two different answers, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all know that, for example, Jay Grave would probably just die as he should. <laughs> so, oh, my um, good I mean, we God. can only hope, at least. Uh, <laughs> you're a jerk. I had listen. listen. There's only room for one jerk in this relationship, and it is absolutely Jay Grave. I was gonna say it was <laughs> Tim, but whatever. Tim and Jay Grave. Uh, you know, G Tim probably is Jay Grave. Like this just seems like the kind of <laughs> like that's probably that's yeah dumb. Um. <laughs> all right, okay, so that's you. it for this episode of the Synthesis. Uh, tune in next week. We're gonna be here on Thursday as usual, and we'll be mirroring it to YouTube. So if you're watching us there, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified about new episodes. Yes. Uh, last thing worth mentioning is Edgeworks Entertainment has a new show on YouTube, so be sure to check it out. It's called Slice of Science. It's a one to two minute series of just cool little facts about space and science that you mm -hmm. may not have known about, animated with some really cool animations by Tanya, who uh, works here at Edgeworks Entertainment. And she's so excited that they're out. Yes. Because she's, she's been working excited. on this, on these for ages. Ages. And so uh, we're super proud of her. Yeah. We've they're got two episodes so out, and they are, I think, the most popular videos that we have released on YouTube so far. So definitely we're check them out. We're not nearly as popular as Tanya. Yeah, apparently. Tanya's pretty cool. Ugh. 
heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> so check out Slice of Science. Uh, if you follow us on YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell. And tune in next week for the next few chapters of The Martian. Oh, my God. Okay, bye.